uh, a little bit more about myself. It was a very wonderful introduction given by Carol. Uh, so I mentioned I'm Ben. I'm based in the Philippines. I work in three main organizations, uh, BNHR, which is an open data and open geospatial consulting business. Um, I'm the data training lead for the Open Knowledge Foundation. We were an international not for profit organization working towards building a, a fair, free, and open future. And I'm the CTO for Smart City. We focus on citizen centric and open by default solutions to smart city uh, problems. So I work around mostly the openness, the data, the technology, and the geospatial fields. Um, so you can find me on on social media, on my website, uh, on the links below. I also support a lot of the open mapping, uh, open geospatial uh, community, especially in the Philippines. Uh, BNHR is a future certifying organization. And I think also right now, it's probably the first and only uh, QGIS sustaining member from my country. And as I mentioned, I support the open mapping and I try to take an active role in the open geospatial community in my country, uh, not just as an individual, but also through the organizations that I'm I'm part of. So I'd like to take the next 10 seconds to also plug and invite everyone to, to join Pista ng Mapa. This will be our third year and basically our second year online. It's a free and open conference that the local op uh, open, open street map and phosphor G communities in the Philippines um, hold. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can find us on pistanangmapa.github.io 2021. Uh, there. <laughs> um, aside from all of that, I'm a uh, gematics engineering student. I'm taking up my graduate um, studies in, from the University of the Philippines. And if it's not um, obvious yet, I'm also a big uh, basketball fan. So that's basically me in a nutshell. And when I, whenever I do this presentation, I always get asked, you know, why, why do I, why do I like mixing uh, basketball and, and spatial? And my answer has always been, it's because basketball itself is spatial. Well, it's actually any sport is spatial. I just really like basketball. So in, in any event in a basketball court, a field goal, you know, a shot, a steal, a rebound, you can get or there's inherent spatial and even spatial temporal information attached to it so it just makes sense to you know analyze it or view it from a very special perspective and it's not really a new thing this this has been done way before me and there's been a lot of studies a lot of research a lot of papers that's been written on you know spatial analysis of of, of basketball and sports it's just that the the amount of data that's being produced right now has made it more uh, mainstream, uh, in a sense. Probably one of the most popular uh, paper or studies about this was the one by Dr. Kirk Coltsberry, uh, Court Vision, where he introduced new visual and spatial analytics, specifically spread and range, to answer the question of who the best shooter was in the NBA. This was around 2012. And this was also actually the inspiration for my undergraduate thesis a few years ago um, where I recreated a system that could extract field goal attempt locations and then perform spatial analysis on those extracted data uh, from broadcast basketball videos. The idea there was there wasn't any data for the Philippines available at that time so we had to get our own data. In fact it was that uh, exact same uh, research which led me to my first phosphor g international conference in seoul uh six years ago uh, this shirt is actually the phosphor g shirt for uh for seoul in 2015. so that's me six years ago presenting about basketball and uh, uh phosphor g and this is me six years later pretty much doing the same thing so in between that time uh from from 2014, 2015 until now, I've also been trying to mix and match different ways to combine, you know, basketball with, with, with spatial. Mostly working on open source technologies. So I've tried uh, using PostGIS as as a database to store uh, my field goal data, and then 
using Q and Grass for, for visualization. Um, I've also tried exploring different kinds of spatial visualizations of shooting. Um, how, how do you best display or visualize field goals? I've tried creating dashboards, and I've even tried using Q itself, UGS itself, as a uh, visualization and analysis platform for, for basketball-related stuff. So over those five, six years, it, it, it's been, it hasn't been an everyday thing, but it's, it's, been, it's been somewhat of a constant, which actually brings me to, to now, you know, to, to what I'm presenting to everyone, which is actually my graduate or my master's degree research, master's thesis research, um, where I want to really formalize how do we utilize spatial analysis to to analyze shooting in Philippine basketball and then applying it into one of the premier collegiate leagues in the country in one of the seasons a few years ago, season 81. Um, one of the last few seasons that happened before COVID. Um, so that's my research. And I, for, for this presentation, I would just like to um, share what's been done and probably what's going to be done in the future and what's what's possible right um, so what what do I want to accomplish in the research I basically wanted to divide the court empirically using the field goal data set without being too arbitrary like we can divide the court any way we want but um, if there's a way to get that from the actual field goal data set itself to tell us how to divide the court that would be better I wanted to find similar players based on their shooting habits at different areas on the court and I wanted to compute spatially aware metrics for comparing and analyzing shooting performance. So for that, I needed a field goal data set that had location information. Unfortunately, uh, similar to how it was a few years ago, there was no, there's no, there was no such existing data set uh, that's easily downloadable for, for the Philippines. Fortunately, though, uh, for season 81, they, they have shot charts saved um, at FIVA Live Stats, which uses um, a system uh, where you can uh, view shot charts from games. So I did what um, probably any programmer would do. I built a scraper, I scraped the data off, then I got basically my field goal data set. And that includes uh, around 7,600 plus field goals, uh, 55 games. There's one missing game. I couldn't find it no matter how hard I tried, uh, divided among 120 plus unique players. And uh, those two maps, basically just the uh, uh, shot chart and a uh, rasterized version of uh, how many field goals there are at different uh, areas of the court, uh, 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter grid. Yeah. So I had the data, now I could focus on really doing the analysis and answering what I, what I wanted to do um, in the research, right? So the first one is actually finding shooting zones or shot types, or how could I divide the court using this data? I had several things that I looked into and I could actually do. Um, one would be, of course, clustering algorithms. If I had a set of, basically I looked at the field goal data set as a point process, and if it, you know, if I have a set of points, how um, what are the ways for you to classify it? You could cluster it, basically. Um, so applying k-means, or I could also do some matrix composition algorithms, principal component analysis, SVDs, and NMF. So I focus on the third one, um, NMF, also known as or known as non-negative matrix factorization. Now, what is NMF? NMF is a uh, from its name, it's a uh, matrix decomposition algorithm wherein all matrices V, W, and H are non negative, and of course, W and H are lower rank than V. Uh, what's interesting about NMF is that its components actually result in or it exhibits a parts based decomposition. Uh, the, the bases, the H, are usually sparse and very interpretable, uh, corresponding to frequently occurring patterns in the data set and very useful in learning parts of objects. In fact, the most, uh, one of the most um, popular use of it was in the analysis of basis vectors for faces, as shown in the photo by uh, Li and Xiong. 
and it makes a lot of sense for 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 basketball really um why if you divide the court into a grid uh, similar to what i did 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter and you compute or count the number of field goals that will that happens inside of that grid it will always be non negative you can't have like negative amount of field goals in 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 that space it, it's just impossible so it, it will always be non negative and the output matrices of the decomposition is actually very um it intuitively corresponds to to basketball concepts the basis h um represents shooting zones the division of the court areas where shots are usually taken and the w or the weights the individual weights of players correspond to the frequency or the tendency of players to shoot at that basis so it makes a lot of sense and it's uh, fairly simple to do you again you discretize the court using a regular tessellation i chose 50 centimeter grids for this one uh, for each player in my data set i fit an intensity surface of these field goals over the discretized court and then i generated my field goal matrix v wherein each uh, row would be a player and each column would be a a cell in the court and then i just applied nmf to compute for w and h and uh, i'm not alone in this it, this has been done several times in, in other studies uh miller uh it's franks and zhao they all uh, utilize nmf to to determine spatial basis vectors of field goals in the nba and uh, one of the things that's really important here as with any clustering or decomposition algorithm is finding the optimal or you know number of bases or optimal rank of the decomposition and in my case i borrowed um, methodologies from the application of nmf in omic data wherein they look for different kind of rank measures to see the optimal rank values and in my case i i inferred from the graphs and from the computations that the optimal number of bases is between three and five so what i wanted to see was uh, what rank would give me you know enough information while not overfitting my my data because you also run the risk of overfitting if you if you have more uh, ranks right so i ran uh, nmf multiple times uh, k equals three four and five and using different parameters um, and then these are what these are the these are basically the outputs and as you can see there's always a uh, a basis corresponding to at rim shots or uh, points uh, near the basket that's component zero the first one uh, three pointers is either component one or component and component four and then mid-range shots component two and three uh, de depending on how many bases you actually utilize i ended up um, deciding on this specific um, this specific nmf with parameters and i did that because one it does not um, understate mid-range shots uh, similar to other decomposition other um, combination of input parameters it also divides almost perfectly the three pointers between component one and component four and if you actually look at um if you look at each of these components as a shooting zone or a shot type you can see that component zero is um shots uh, within the restricted area or shots at the rim you have wing and k3 pointers for component one component two is mid-range and some paint uh, component three is uh, left block and all the other parts of the paint and component four are, are corner three pointers and some parts of the wing three pointers so now that i have this uh, shooting basically the the basis that's the h i could also use the w which is the individual player weights to to look at player shooting habits or how much or players shoot at each of these five shooting bases um, and then i just look at the 10 right here i'm showing the 10 most uh the 10 players with the most field goals during that season and basically their shooting habits the higher the value the more shots they take at that area the lower the value the less and from here you can actually see you can it gives you more 
information about where players take the shots. At the same time, you can also infer some things about like player similarities. If they have uh, similar weights at similar areas and or they have the same distribution of, of shots, then they you can consider them as having similar, you know, similar habits. In fact, uh, I did just that to find similar players. Uh, what I did was I very simple. I computed for the Euclidean distance between each player uh, using the five basis weights. And then using this distance, I looked for five nearest neighbors. I identified the five nearest neighbors. Um, and then using to enforce symmetry, if player K is a neighbor player L, I assume that player L is also the um, neighbor player K. And then I, I graphed those and I, I looked at what, what that could have possibly meant. And this is one of the things that I saw. Um, basically, I found two, the, the average is uh, around six to nine neighbors and uh, the distance between each neighbor is around 1.53. But I found some players with uh, distances, average distance between its neighbors as um, very low, 0 0.1. And these are actually players who like to take shots uh, at component zero or at the rim. And then I also, have, I also found players who have really high uh, this average distances, which could mean that they have very uncommon shooting habits. Uh, and then I also rank, I showed it per team. There's a graph of it per team. And what you can uh, see here would be uh, if teams have a very uh, short uh, range of, of values for the distances, you could, we could argue <laughs> that, you know, these teams run a very predictable offense, no matter who the player is on the on the court, because they all shoot similarly, because they all have the same shooting habits, basically. And the the larger the the range, of course, the more diverse the shooting habits of the players are. And then um, last, I tried to compute for spatially aware met, uh, shooting metrics first by modeling you know, scoring better. Uh, the problem is I if you, I try to use PPA or points per attempt, but because not all not all cells there are field goals and sometimes there are cells where there are very small number of field goals. Uh, the, the raw computation, which is points over field goal attempts, might not properly indicate the actual rate at that location. So the result of this map is usually peppered and very noisy, something like that. Um, so what I did was I did some, I computed for the empirical base estimate of PPA at each cell using those uh, formulas um, based also on a study by Shortridge. Uh, the prior distribution for the empirical base estimate included nearby cells to my uh, cell in uh, of interest and also cells that are equidistant to that cell. Um, the addition of the equidistant cells, there is some assumption that the shooting is somewhat uh, symmetrical on, from the left uh, and the right side of the field. And of course, uh, the beauty of EV, of empirical base estimate, is I could actually remove that, uh, that, that, uh, those cells and I could compute another version of the EV estimate. But for, in my case and for this study, I, I included that. And these are some examples of uh, neighborhood cells for, for, for for different air cells where where players take shots, and then I was able to compute uh, the empirical base estimate of PPA, which is a uh, much much smoother um, a map of the points per attempt, the one on the right than the one on the left. So what's next? Um, this isn't finished yet, so i'm still going i'm going to use the empirical base estimated ppa to compute for spatially aware metrics such as uh, spatial speci scoring effectiveness this is similar to the metric introduced by shortridge it's basically a measure of uh based on the spatial distribution of field goals of a player how many points per attempt is he scoring more or below than the estimated points per attempt so the the Methodology for that is quite simple. You, you using the player's field goal locations, you compute for the ex, ex, expected points per attempt, and then you compare that to his actual points per attempt. And then it has a global and a local version. The global version is a single number that can indicate 
you know, whether or not players scoring more than expected or not. And the local version is computed per cell and can be mapped out uh, to show the special distribution of, of SSSC, basically which areas on the court of players scoring more or less than expected. And then there's also points relative to league, to league average, um, which is similar to points over league average, again, from, from Shortridge. Uh, it's a very similar to SSSE. The difference is this computes, instead of points per attempt, uh, raw points, the number of points scored by a player above or below what's expected of him. The computation is pretty much the same. You, you use the field goal locations to compute for the expected points, and then you subtract that from the actual points he scored. And you have a global version, which is, again, a singular number that, that would tell you his performance. And you can also have localized versions computed per cell that you can map uh, around the court. Uh, what else? I want to be able to compare teams and players using these metrics. I want to compare these metrics to conventional shooting uh, statistics. And also uh, try to do some sniff test with fans, players, and coaches if the metrics actually you know, make sense. Um, uh, last few slides, uh, just some of the phosphorus applications and uh, other open source tools, tools that I've used. Uh, in the early stages, I was using quite a bit of Q, Postgres, and Grass. Um, now I'm leaning more towards uh, doing the analysis and the visualizations in Python and R. Um, and a lot of R libraries that don't have logos I've used. Um, and yeah, if you want to learn more or collaborate, uh, everything is on my GitHub. Uh, even, uh, I think, an uh, outdated version of the manuscript that I'm currently writing is there. So even the code is there if you want to see if, if if it makes sense. And that's it. Um, thank you very much for, for listening. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm free, for, I'm free to answer them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ben. Um, I'm actually mind boggled at the work <laughs> and the effort that you put into this um, study. Um, there are a couple of questions, which I'm really happy about. Um, so the first one is, did you see any differences in shot or playing patterns between the Philippine players and patterns in Goldsbury's NBA maps? Uh, yeah. Um, actually, what was quite surprising for me when I was looking at the because uh, this was collegiate basketball, not 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 yet professional. But when I when I was was looking at at the data, what was quite surprising is there's not a lot of corner three pointers. Right? Um, in the NBA, it's like um, it's aside from layups and dunks, the corner three pointer is the most. It's called the most efficient shot in basketball. Uh, closest, it's the closest distance that would give you three pointers, three points. Right. Um, it wasn't as common in 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 the data set that I worked with, albeit all it was only one season, but it wasn't as common as I as I had expected. Um, than probably comparing to something that you would see from an NBA game, and yeah, a lot of shots that aren't three pointers. Uh, some mid range. There's still a lot of mid range shots in in the in the data set that I'm working on. And uh, I think mostly when you look at the NBA game, uh, the mid-range has almost died out. And it's uh, it's either you know free throws, three pointers, or layups. Um that's basically the, the scoring right now in when you look at uh, the NBA. But just yeah, so there might the differences could be attributed to a lot of things. Um, this is a collegiate league and then uh, yeah differences in styles of players, styles of coaching. But just looking at the, the data set itself outside of that context, those are some of the differences that I noticed. Great. Um, okay. The next question is, uh, did you ever group players by team and game in order to see if there were any general spatial patterns for the winning teams versus losing teams? I will be doing that <laughs> in the next part of the of the research. Um, once I once I start computing the uh, the two metrics that I'm really looking at, SSSE and and Perla, and then I, I want to be able to compare and contrast the, the 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 winning teams from the losing from the losing teams. Or basically, in in this case, since there are only eight teams in this league, uh, the final four teams 
which go into the final four, and then the bottom four teams were with who aren't able to get into the final four. So I want to see if, um, as mentioned in the question, if there are significant differences in in the metrics of 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 those two teams, or even in the makeup of the players of those two teams based on the metrics, is that difference significance high significant? And um, lastly, if you could use you know that performance in shooting as as a way to to indicate basically performance uh, on a team level if they will win or not um because that's practically one of the questions that you always ask does it correlate to winning so does it mean that if you have this high metric does it correlate to winning so i've done some of those things before not not totally spatial finding some uh you know uh, advanced metrics that could uh, predict winnability, but I've uh, I also try to look at uh, at that here and see if these metrics are somewhat correlated to, you know, team performance in terms of whether they win or whether they lose. Cool. That's just mind boggled because <laughs> um, you did mention that you did um, were able to kind of determine players' habits just from the yeah. the shooting. Um, habits, you would, if I would say. Um, so from the results that you got from your study, were you able to actually feed these back to the teams and kind of give them some advice like, oh, maybe, you know, you're... <laughs> yeah, that, 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 would, that, would be the, that would be the next step. Uh, uh -huh. Unfortunately, the, the, pa the, the past two years, because of COVID, there hasn't been like any games. So <laughs> sorry, there's nothing to, <laughs> there's the, but uh, yeah, part of this would be to um to reach out to the players, to the teams themselves, and yeah, the sniff test to try to check if this makes sense from the perspective of not just players and teams, but also fans. Um, because that's that's usually the, the case with the, with these things, and if it passes, then 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 great. Uh, if not, then maybe there are some tweaks here and there that we can do to um to make it more appealing or at the same time to 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 not have that much dissonance between uh what what coaches or what what people are seeing versus what your statistic is actually um or saying but most of the time hopefully there's harmony if not um we'll see which one is more accurate the, the eye or or the statistic right <laughs> enough well um thanks so much ben for your presentation um, thank you as well got some wonderful comments um about your maps looking awesome a great example for teaching thematic map classification map design and symbolizing map multiple variables at once um yeah um we hope to see you maybe at the next <laughs> yeah. maybe we'll hopefully finished. i'm done by that time <laughs> Hopefully, I'll cross my fingers for you. And I Thank hope you, you have a good uh, rest of the conference, Ben. Yes, you as well. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. <laughs> right. Um, so our next presentation is by Andy Tabinas. I hope I am pronouncing her name correctly. I It's 5 a.m. here in Fiji, unfortunately. <laughs> um, her presentation is actually quite interesting. Um, it's Manila Odd, Mapping Soundscapes Through Participatory Data Collection, a Case Study of Metro Manila. Andy is a licensed environmental planner and Tableau, data, uh, Tableau Desktop Specialist. She's also a MSc Geomatics Engineering student and a geospatial scientist. She volunteers with, she's an OpenStreetMap volunteer and founder of Mental Health Awareness, which aims to promote awareness by